Hello everyone, today we're doing a chat with Jeffrey Mumford, who's a composer here at Lorain County Community College in Ohio. He's very acclaimed. He has uh, gotten grants from the Guggenheim Foundation, American Music Center, Ohio Arts Council. He's had his works performed by the National Symph Symphony Orchestra and in Minnesota, Atlanta, Cleveland, you name it. And uh, he's even been praised by the New York Times. <laughs> what is it like to, um, to, to have your work be appreciated on such a large scale? Well, it's terrific to have, you know, to know that your music is touching somebody, and, and I've had the benefit of having some really good performances by some of the organizations you mentioned, and it's incredibly gratifying. Um, the, the the journey of an artist, the the odyssey of an artist, you know, is, is um, very complex, and so it's always very heartwarming and gratifying when you realize that, that it is actually reaching somebody. Right. I think that's probably the most an artist can hope for, I would right. think, at least sure. in, from my perspective. It's a language, it's communication. So. What is it about music in particular that you think uh, does better than other art mediums for talking to people like that? Well, I wouldn't create a hierarchy like that. I mean, every art form communicates. This is just the way I feel I can best express myself. My wife's a fantastic painter in her work. It's very, very brilliant and, and touching and communicative and very powerful. Um, dance, literature, I mean, the, every art form is important. What compels you most, uh, particularly to music? Or have you always been? I started out way? as a painter, actually, and the uh -huh. music took over my sophomore year in college. I've always felt like I've heard music in my head, and certainly um, certain pieces that I discovered in this lifetime, I felt like I heard in a previous lifetime, if that makes sense. And so it had e e even a deeper resonance. It's hard to describe why. It's a temporal art form, and you, it's like you can walk into the experience. That's what I hope, anyway. Uh, how in particular did you become a composer? That doesn't seem like a very direct uh, career path. And, um... Actually, there are many uh, composers who are artists. Who Schoenberg was an artist. Um, Gershwin was a painter. Mm -hmm. um, I grew up in a house that had lots of music. My father had a very large Count Basie mm -hmm. collection, Count Basie being an amazing jazz band leader. Um, and so I, that was a formative aspect in my upbringing. So music was always a part of my life that way. So, and I remember one of the form most formative experiences I had in uh, elementary school in sixth grade. There was a program in the D.C. public schools where we would go to hear the National Symphony um, and D.A.R. Constitution Hall, which was the same hall, unfortunately, that d denied Marian Anderson a place to sing, and then she sang the historic concert on the steps of Lincoln Memorial. It's a grand hall, and I looked and seen this plush um, interior and imagining what it would be like to have a piece played here. Um, just the idea of all these people in, on stage making this glorious sound. The concert was the 1812 Overture by Tchaikovsky, Sources of Prentice by Dukas, um, and the New World Symphony by Dvorak. I still remember that. It's such a, it had such a very powerful, visceral impact uh, on me. There's nothing like it. I mean, for me, in a sense, to have an orchestra play your music, it's, there's so many sonic possibilities in an orchestra. And it's, 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 again, it's again, you can walk into a, the world of sound. So I hope to create that, no matter what instrument I'm writing for, with a solo violin, or 80 people, I want that experience. So what was the first time that someone performed one of your pieces in front of an audience? Um, professionally, I guess it would be 1977 in Washington. I wrote a piece for violin and piano that was played by a group that I was a member of called the Contemporary Music Forum, which still exists today. Um, and I got my first review in the Washington Post, and it was fortunately a positive review by a reviewer who isn't necessarily wasn't necessarily given to liking contemporary music. His name was Paul Hume, oh, wow. and he had a very he was very <laughs> he could be very severe. But fortunately, he was kind to me that day. That's yeah. been quite an honor. It was. Do you have a, a favorite piece out of all your works, or is it kind of like choosing one of your favorite children? Well, the standard response a composer answers to that question is the piece I'm writing now. Ah. Because once your piece is done, it's there, and now you're in the world of the new piece you're writing. So right now, I'm fully um, in the world of this piece for a soprano, harp, and, and cello. To the text of a fantastic poet named Sonia Sanchez, African-American poet, whose work I've said before, actually, and whose work I love deeply. Um, and so that's the world I'm in now. I, just, I finished a piano concerto about a month ago, um, and then that was everything. Now that that's done, this piece is everything. And then when I finish that, the cello concert I'm going to write, that will be everything. So it's just, you know, 
you ever get indulgent and kind of look back on uh, some of your old stuff or think, oh, I should have done this a little bit differently? Or That can be a slippery slope. I have, and I actually have revised older pieces, but that's a real, um, you know, you have to be very careful about that because you're not the same person you were uh, when you wrote the piece. That is, you're looking at the piece through different eyes and ears, but sometimes you can see just that little thing that will make the piece more resonant or, or achieve as a, my, one of my... Um, as prior composition teachers, Lawrence Moss, said that achieves your own ends. And it's a rare teacher, he was a very rare teacher, who was able to identify a student's aims and not impose his own aesthetic on that. Because he saw what I was trying to do and he would, but in lessons would say, I don't think you're achieving what you want to achieve. And I'm, I, 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 I was very grateful he was able to do that. And so when I look back at certain pieces and think, mm, this could be, no, and, and I realized that, yes, I could do this, and it would, Mostly, I like to just move on to the next piece, but there are occasions where I can I have been able to do that. I mean, they've been better, I think, afterwards. So even though, like you said, you're constantly evolving, you're a different person as these mm -hmm. pieces go by, um, do you feel like there's an overarching uh, theme to your work in particular? Uh, most of my work is very heavily influenced by cloud imagery and time of day and light. Mm -hmm. um, I love the idea of Clouds is a metaphor for the structures that I create in my work, things that are constantly re recombining, spitting off. Um, I love thunderstorms in Washington, D.C. in the summertime. Thunderstorms are a very prominent component of the <laughs> atmosphere. And I love to and, and remember in high school looking out the window and seeing how clouds just evolved across the sky, becoming, you know, shifting uh, in foreground and background. And, and the light, the light playing off the cloud, through the clouds, in the clouds, and that was always very fascinating to me. And, and then that was inspiring to me as a painter, and as a composer, the same thing it comes very, very primary with me, the idea of light. It's really color. fascinating, yeah, because I've listened to a little bit of your stuff, and I, I felt like um, it left a lot of questions. Mm -hmm. I like the, the mystery of it, so I can see how relating that to the clouds, and how, you know, the vastness and the, and the mystery of them, I think that's a really, no, really you. fascinating inspiration. Yeah. Never ending. Um, do you have a particular environment that you like to be in when you write your music? Hmm, that's a good question. I've been able to write pretty well wherever I've been. I have a studio in my home, and um, that, that works pretty well. I mean, ideal environment, I don't know what that would be. <laughs> I mean, some place in the south of France, you know, I don't know, but for now this will do. <laughs> Yeah, I think uh, I think sometimes people make excuses when it comes to environment. You know, they say, well, mm -hmm. if I, I just had a little bit of a different, I could I could write better, or I could right. do this better. But it, I I think that's a great uh, that you acknowledge that you know it can happen anywhere. Time is the greatest luxury. Just time, oh, focus, yeah. time, uninterrupted time to be with your own thoughts. That's the best. Do you have a particular instrument that you? I mean, again, that's about <laughs> choosing out of so many, right. but is there one that you favor over others, perhaps? If I, if I had to choose, if someone actually made me choose, thankfully they don't make me choose, <laughs> I guess it would be the cello. I love the cello. I've been a lot for the cello. cello. Um, it has the widest range of any string instrument. It's so expressive. And so that would be, I mean, right now I'm writing a lot of harp music. I love the harp, too. Mm -hmm. um, so thankfully I don't have to choose. Because every instrument has a world inside of it. In a similar vein, though, maybe this will be a little bit easier. Do you have a least favorite instrument that you just can't stand? <laughs> yeah. That's hard to pinpoint. I mean, I've, I've never written for bagpipes, but I'm sure <laughs> there are good pieces out there for bagpipes. You sound a little hesitant about this. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't. You know, I mean, every who knows? One day I, I will I'll, I'll wake up and, and be inspired to write this piece for bagpipe. And kazoo. I mean, I don't know right now, but I, you know, like, like, so I don't want to. <laughs> I want all options to be open. I'm drawn more to certain instruments than others, but I can't find instrument I really don't like. I mean, I, there are cer there are certain uses of the instruments that I'm less attracted to than others, but all instruments have their virtues and beauties. Right. So, uh, if you had to give any advice to someone who is uh, potentially interested in becoming a composer, um, can you think of anything off the top of your head that you feel like would be a good uh, advice for someone like that? Listen to as much music as possible. Just open your ears and your heart and listen and hear how things work, how different composers approach um, what they're trying to communicate. Um, and write, 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 write. Just write a lot of music and, and get feedback from performers is very important as well because it's communicates the language. And the music doesn't exist until it's played. So make good friends with performers as well. 
Well, thank you very much for your time, Mr. Mumford. My pleasure. Thank you. Uh, his work is available online all over, right? Like I, I saw his uh, iTunes, and iTunes, and Spotify, and Amazon. And Amazon. Uh, in fact, his latest is through a stillness brightening, right? Yes, thanks. I yeah. thought that was very beautiful, so I would definitely recommend you check that out. But thank you well, once thank more. Thank you very much. <laughs> it's been my pleasure. Really appreciate it.